I've never been afraid of the unknown. It fascinates me. In my travels in Tibet and Afghanistan, I had my landmarks. Voyage after voyage, I eventually began to feel at home. But an adventurer who gets too comfortable is no longer an adventurer. So I took to the sea. This ocean liner plowing through the sea at full speed is not only taking me on a trip around the world, but is also transporting me back in time in my new role of gentleman voyager to revisit the golden age of ocean travel. Ever since King Francois I of France and the Age of Discovery, Le Havre has always had its sights turned towards the open sea. More recently, this was the port of departure for the ocean liners of the Golden Age, the Normandy, the Ile de France, the Queen Mary. So it's no mere chance that I head for Le Havre to embark on the Queen Elizabeth, the heir of those great liners, which is preparing for her first trip around the world. It's almost time to cast off. In spite of my excitement about the coming trip, I can't help feeling a twinge thinking about my wife and daughter, whom I'm leaving behind for four months. So, rather than dwell on that, I go seek some advice from Pierre, who has spent his life on ocean liners. Now, a round-the-world trip is not your ordinary voyage. You'll see. Sailing around the world, even for a sailor like me, was just fantastic. Just imagine, I was 15 for my first trip, a 15-year-old kid in the early 50s who discovers America, New York. It was a dream, a dream I could never have imagined before. Do you think that I, a, a simple landlubber, will acquire some sort of feeling for the sea? Well, it could be. No guarantees? No guarantees, no. That's not included in the ticket. Right. <laughs> but in any case, you'll see. It's going to be your personal experience. Not everyone feels the same thing, you know. After setting out from Le Havre, we made a stop in Hamburg. Now, the Queen Elizabeth is docked in Southampton. The passenger terminal is abuzz with activity. The British passengers are arriving en masse. Soon there'll be 2,000 passengers on board, a small town that the dockers are rushing to load with supplies. Stragglers are now finally on board. Ten past ten in the evening. Escorted by the Queen Mary II, which is headed for a long voyage in the Indian Ocean, the Queen Elizabeth casts off and Southampton bids a rousing bon voyage to its two ambassadors. beginning to realize that this voyage I'm embarking on is not your ordinary trip. I spend a lot of time gazing out over the ocean. The butterflies I had before the departure have disappeared. Now I feel like a pioneer. This crossing of the Atlantic is my conquest of the West. Back when the liners ruled the North Atlantic, it took four days to sail from Southampton to New York. Now 
nowadays, speed is no longer a priority. The Queen Elizabeth is a 21st century liner, powerful, stable, comfortable. Yet she has inherited from her illustrious predecessors a certain art of living at sea and a delightfully retro atmosphere. The first steam liners were put into service on the North Atlantic at the beginning of the 19th century. Ever bigger, swifter, and more luxurious, they became the symbols of their country's might and prestige. Emigrants and movie stars, they both had their roles to play in that golden age of ocean liners. Objects, photos, mementos, here on board, we're steeped in the history of Cunard's ocean liners, and in particular, the first, Queen Elizabeth. Apart from the name, and certain made-in-Cunard traditions that are still respected, this modern liner has nothing in common with the old Queen Elizabeth, which ended its days near Hong Kong in 1972. So I'd like to know, what prompted you to take a trip around the world? Back when I first saw a globe, right from my first geography lessons, I guess I thought to myself, Someday, I'll have to take a trip around that. And right up to sailing, I kept thinking, I can't believe this, it can't be true, it's not real. But when you're in the boat, in the cabin, when you're out on the high seas, you're there and it's real. Yes, you're there. turbulent sea tosses the Queen Elizabeth about like a plaything. An eight-metre swell is rocking my city on the sea. Passengers stagger along the passageways. They say those who are walking straight are drunk. Seasickness can strike anyone at any time. And it's torture when you have to work for days on end, closed up in an office without any daylight. If there's any mistakes, don't blame me. The daily programme is the newsletter that we give to the guests. And we get, it's there every day to give them all the information that they need to know, what's going on on the ship, meal times, um, when we go to the port, what the port days are, things like that. So for that, you have to be in connection with many departments? Every single department on the ship. So I do it in English, and then we have Japanese, German, French, and Spanish. So when I do the English version, I send it to them, and they interpret in their language, and then they do the same as me and send it to the printer. On an ocean liner, the captain is God Almighty, which means he is hard to approach. 
but a bit of patience and tenacity can open even the most stubborn doors. So, we're off to the bridge around 200 meters away in the fore of the ship. The air is thick with tension. I observe, I listen, and wait. I heard that the Atlantic uh, is supposed to be gray color. Is it true? Mostly, the sea reflects the colour of the sky. Now, the North Atlantic is, is maybe famous for having some cloud, but it's also famous for having weather systems going across it. Mm -hmm. It's the weather systems that brings the rougher seas, and the weather systems bring uh, cloud and rain, and sometimes fog, and the cloud and the rain and the fog brings the grey colour. So that's why the North Atlantic is perhaps more famous for being grey than blue. And are you, are you from a family of, uh, um, I mean, did your father have a connection with the sea? Uh, there was no family tradition of being at sea, mm -hmm. uh, or, of working at sea. However, my parents met on an ocean liner. My mother was accompanying her uncle and my father was accompanying his mother on a trip to South Africa and they met and they got engaged in Cape Town and they were married. And so perhaps somewhere there is some salt in my veins. Twelfth day at sea. The route that I trace on my globe is a reference, of course, the proof that the voyage is progressing. It's also my connection back to my family in France. the tip of Manhattan, the Statue of Liberty. I can just imagine the deliverance experienced by the millions of immigrants fleeing poverty and persecution when, after such a long voyage, they first laid eyes on these symbols of America. Beacon city of the 20th century, El Dorado of modern times, New York continues to embody the American dream, and yet many things have changed. This is a subject of concern for Father Perry, whom I'm going to meet at his church in Brooklyn. My grandparents came to America from Ukraine, and they passed through Ellis Island. And if you go to Ellis Island and you look for the name Perry, you won't find it because their name was changed there and they did not even know it because the people who were responsible for, for Ellis Island um, had in trouble with the Cyrillic alphabet and also with anything that wasn't WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And so the name Perineme Vida became Perry. Where my father grew up in, in Queens, um, everyone came from Eastern Europe. 
there were Czechs, there were Slovaks, there were Poles, there were Ukrainians, there were Russians, and their basic language was a Slavic language. So they created a language that they could all understand. In the old days, they would talk about the, um, the melting pot. But in fact, the newer theory is the, the salad bowl theory, because in the salad bowl, every leaf maintains its identity, but it's coated with the sauce of the American identity, too. Despite the force of the symbol, the Statue of Liberty did not welcome all comers with open arms. The richer passengers disembarked at Manhattan. The immigrants were sent into quarantine on Ellis Island. To cross over to New York, they had to have $25 on them, answer the administration's questions, and pass the medical inspections. 2% of the new arrivals were refused entry and sent back to their country of origin. From the time it opened in 1892 until its closing in 1954, 12 million immigrants passed through Ellis Island. Il y a encore une immigration aujourd'hui? There, oh, there's constantly an immigration. Now people come from Africa, they come from South America, so it's a, it's a, a slightly different dynamic. There is an American dream. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the American dream is not as beautiful as it used to be. It's just a question of who's at the bottom now, mm -hmm. okay? You know, at one time it was the Irish at the bottom, and now the Irish have, ris have risen, you know? It was the Italians at the bottom. Um, at, when I was growing up, all grocery stores, all vegetable stores were owned by Italians. Now they're owned by Koreans. As we say in Brooklyn, go figure. Uh -huh. yeah. Merci beaucoup, Father. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. The Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn. These districts are home to all the diversity of the new immigration and where we're going to meet Siomara. She's from Puerto Rico. So, you're a musician? Yes. Singer, songwriter, actress. Uh-huh. And uh, screenwriter. You came in New York to, to, to live your music, to make your music? To pursue my dreams, yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. I had $200 when I came here. Yes. Two days after I was 18, I, I left. I left my house. And I settled here, and I've been here for quite a while. And I, I, like, I like New York. Um, it, it's a very tough city to live in. But it's also very inspiring. It keeps you on your toes. Like, you come here to work to get out but you find yourself working here forever to get out, but you never get out. <laughs> you kind of get stuck. so much in regards to different cultures that I also feel part of a world that's uh, sort of becoming smaller. Um, although that takes away from the fact that we should move away from the surface of our skin uh -huh. and just accept each other for who we are and that's why we're here. We're here to, to exper experiment different things.
To prolong the Big Apple fever, I made the rounds of the ship's different bars last night. So this morning I'm, let's say, a bit under the weather, and I just let my breakfast tray guide me to a table it chose for me on the port side. Since we left New York, we've been heading south, so this is the sunny side of the ship. Ten decks below, I find Burma Road, the main passageway that crosses the entire crew zone. Here, thanks to Sudakan, I'm going to pass through to the other side of the looking glass. We're off for a little tour. This is the uh, crew gym. So this is the only laundrette which is open all time, 24 hours open. There are 16 computers here where the crew can access uh, internet. So if you leave the offices apart, majority of them are eating here. The crew members open certain timings for the food. All the items which are stored outside should also come inside. The offices. Uh -huh. yeah, only offices. <laughs> we contribute uh, here to beautify the ship. Pastry, scones, all are made from this baking oil. So the, the baker is not French? What is it? No. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Yeah, this is where all the meat is kept. There you go. Nicely dressed. <laughs> I'm going out. Thank you, all. Thank you very much. It's super hot there. <laughs> They have a lovely view of the bridge and they can actually see what's happening here. And oh, that's Ed there. <laughs> With the North Atlantic now far behind us, the passengers have donned their shorts. Some are sunning in the deck chairs, others are playing shuffleboard. With the warmth of the Florida sun, the decks of the Queen Elizabeth take on the atmosphere of the old-time ocean liners. Wait. No, see, you're not pushing it. January the 21st. Since we left New York three days ago, we've covered 1,700 kilometers. We arrive in Miami, the world capital of ocean cruises. Dozens and dozens of ships set out from this port every day to make their rounds in the waters of the Caribbean Sea. I leave these mastodons to their strange ballet and head for Miami Beach, the mecca of Art Deco. In 1926, a fire destroyed an entire sector of the city. When they rebuilt, the architects, inspired by Art Deco, which had been born the year before in Paris, created an authentic Floridian genre characterized by pastel tones. Tropical Art Deco. In the 1960s, the sector was nearly torn down. It was eventually saved, and the Art Deco district has now become the showcase of the city. 
Miami, Miami is a tourist place? Yes, Miami and the beaches is a tourist area. Um, it's our biggest industry. Over 108,000 people are hired in the tourism industry here in Miami and the beaches. So um, it's a number one hire. We get a lot of um, folks from the Caribbean that come here. Matter of fact, people come here to work seasonally in some of the restaurants and um, the hotels. How old were you when you left Jamaica? I was 18. I came to college. I fell in love with the destination. I, I'm in the industry, the travel and tourism industry. My degree is in that industry. And of course, there's so much to work with here that I, I stayed. I loved it. I, I succeeded more here than had I been in Jamaica. So in a way, Miami is an um, atmosphere of South America or Caribbean. It's not, it's not US anymore. It is? It still is, but um, there's a, quite a mixture here. It's very cosmopolitan. The flavor of the Caribbean we call Floribian, Florida Caribbean. So yes, we still have our, um, it's America, but there's a very nice flavor to it, and we love it. It's what makes Miami, Miami. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but do you feel more American than Jamaican? No, I still feel Jamaican. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm Jamaican, to the bone, I'm Jamaican. <laughs> and I'll ultimately retire home. Uh -huh. Yes, I'll retire at home. Leaving Miami, I have the same strange feeling as when I left New York. That is, each port of call enriches me with new memories while, at the same time, stripping me of my dreams. Living out one's voyage, or dreaming it, which is more beautiful. The soirees on board the Queen Elizabeth obey a strict dress code. The ship's newsletter specifies that one must be elegant casual, semi-formal, or, as is the case tonight, formal. There you go. And one, two, three. Okay. Thank you. So have a lovely evening. Bon soir. Bon soir. And you, ladies and gentlemen, currently represent 36 different nationalities. The ship's company, number 999, they represent 50 different nationalities, ladies and gentlemen. We're very proud that so many different nationalities work so closely together to look after you.
Sailing out of Florida, we continue southward, leaving the dozens of touristic islands that dot the Caribbean to the other cruise ships, the Queen Elizabeth heads for Cartagena in Colombia. On the way, we drop anchor once for a relaxing day on Gran Cayman. Cartagena of the Indies. What a magical name. In a flash of poetic inspiration, the conquistadors link the memory of ancient Carthage to the fabulous Indies. I pass through the fortifications of San Felipe Castle and plunge into the heart of the old colonial city. I don't need a guidebook. The entire history of this lively, colorful city can be read on the faces of the inhabitants. When the Spaniards came to colonize this area, we were Indians. And then when they came here and they settled here, they realized that they could like uh, colonize this area. When they realized that about the constructions they were going to need and all that, they realized that they would need to have slaves. They could not use the Indians as slaves. So that's why they decided to bring the black people from Africa. But also, black people was taken there by British too. But mainly in South America is where the Spaniards brought the black blood. Wow. That we're proud of that. Yeah, you should. <laughs> yeah, it's something that says when you go black, you never get back. Yeah. <laughs> but after we got independence, then they started to mix each other. You know, Indians with the black slaves, Indians with Spaniards, the Spaniards with the black people, and the results of that gave us this skin that we called ourselves mestizos. Before leaving, Willie opens the door of an old colonial house to me. Inside, his friends, Los Gaiteros de San Jacinto, are rehearsing. The cumbia is the symbol of Colombia because here in Colombia, we do the cumbia. They do it in other countries also, but it's different. The Colombian cumbia has a different feeling. It's a more sentimental, joyous cumbia. The lyrics are different. And we really identify with the cumbia. So that's why I say that the cumbia really represents us. The natives, the blacks, the whites, we make up one single race, one blood. The cumbia represents us all. moment the strains of the cumbia linger on, prolonging the contact with Cartagena. Then they fade to be replaced by the tinkle and murmur of the social life aboard the Queen Elizabeth. Alain Delord and Sophia Lorraine. <laughs> la parade, la parade. La parade de Champs-Élysées. Ah, okay. Ah, okay.
Far from the noisy atmosphere of the jazz club, a man strides the deserted decks of this floating city, cutting through the inky night. Hey, good evening. Good evening. How are you? You all right? Yeah, fine. Good, good, good. I mean, people kind of like this is their home when they're on vacation, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get, uh, you know, things happen, you know. A drunk guest or... Not drunk, I wouldn't say drunk guest. Very happy argument. guest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... If there are issues that, you know, arises at night that uh, I kind of like need security, then I do call security to to ah, come okay, and assist. Okay. I'm more kind of like a so stoma. You, you the eyes, not, not the arm. Yeah, I over, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Six thirty in the morning. Surrounded by thick vegetation, we're advancing slowly towards the Gatun Locks, which mark the entry to the Panama Canal. The Queen Elizabeth, which up until now has been sailing freely, now finds herself bound by an army of locomotives the mulas, a name chosen as a reminder of the mules that used to tow the boats along the rivers and canals. is 33.3 meters wide and the ship 32.5. With the delicacy of a princess fitting her dainty foot into a glass slipper, the Queen Elizabeth slides into the Gatun lock. It almost looks simple, yet it took an authentic exploit, technical as well as human, to cut through the isthmus of Central America, 77 kilometers that link the planet's two largest oceans. Already in the 15th century, Charles V imagined a canal to transport Peru's riches back to Spain without having to take the long route around the Cape of Good Hope. In 1882, Ferdinand de Lesseps began the construction, but poorly adapted tools and workers falling victim to malaria, amongst other mishaps, forced the project into bankruptcy. In 1904, the United States took over the project and the canal was officially opened on August 15, 1914. It was a veritable revolution for maritime traffic. The Queen Elizabeth will cover 9,500 kilometers to go from New York to San Francisco. Without the canal, she would have had to round Cape Horn and cover close to 22,500 kilometers. Crossing the Panama Canal takes all day. After the lakes, there's the Gaia Trench cut into the mountain the Miraflores locks. Then we go under the Bridge of the Americas, and there before me lies the Pacific Ocean. Leaving the Panama Canal, we take a sharp right turn and head up the coast of Central America. We make a first stop in Costa Rica, where we spend part of the day discovering the tropical forest and the other part at a big popular festival on the shore of the Pacific. Continuing northwards, the Queen Elizabeth drops anchor at Cabo San Lucas, a very trendy resort town in Baja California.
a final brush stroke. And it's time to meet Colin Black, the chief engineer in the engine control room. From day one, from, from the build, I was chief engineer in the shipyard. So we have 75 people in the department. So nine, nine people on watch and the rest are actually doing all the maintenance. Anything that can break is, is my responsibility to fix. This is the operation screens. We have the operation screens here. And then this is the main propulsion screen. So that's the Azipod. Instead of pushing the old ships, push. This one pulls. It's more efficient. And then you get the full flow of water across the propeller, so it's more efficient. Escorted by one of Colin's assistants, I penetrate into the ship's inner workings. Here we find the ship's engines, not only those used for traction, but also those that produce electricity, heat, cool air, drinking water, and that grind up and retreat waste material. While I'm taking my tour of this huge Meccano set, several decks above, all the waiter captains are gathered for a briefing in the Britannia. Okay, it's one hour back this evening, so make sure all your crew are aware to let the guests know. They have an extra hour in their beds this evening. And tomorrow night we have a deck party for the guests at 9.30 in the Lido. Thank you very much. Have a fabulous evening. Make sure that you have everybody by the doors on both levels, upper and lower, please. Just two minutes before six o'clock, ready for when we open the doors back as usual. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's nice to be on board. It's a nice life. I wanted to travel the world, see the world, yeah. and get paid for it. <laughs> so do you feel like a traveler? Yeah. That? Because you're very busy. Yeah, you're very busy, but still you wake up in a different place most days. How many customers do you have? Me, 22. Yeah. yeah, you have to know habits, how they like things, if they have any special diets. If they like ice in their water, no ice in their water, yeah, you have to know. You have to learn these things. Obviously, you don't know the first day or two, but in time you have to learn what coffee they like, how they like it, yeah. So we do six months here, two months at home. Of course I miss home, but then you develop a family on board. So I have a family on board and I have a family at home. When I'm here, I miss my family at home. When I'm home, I miss my family here. So it's very strange. Her prow cutting through the veils of darkness, the Queen Elizabeth penetrates the Golden Gate, a fleeting tableau in red and black. The Golden Gate, Alcatraz, steep streets, cable cars. This is my first time in San Francisco and all these images crowd in on me. I eventually decide to visit another district, just as rich in the city's history, Chinatown. In the mid-19th century, many Chinese, fleeing poverty and war, emigrated to San Francisco to work on railroad construction. In spite of the discrimination against them, the Chinese made their home in the city. By 1880, San Francisco counted over 7,500 Chinese laundries. San Francisco's Chinatown is still the largest in the United States, after New York's. Mm, so your two parents are Chinese? Yes, my parents are Chinese. Then my grandfather came first with my grandmother, and then they brought the rest of the family. Okay. Yeah, so I wasn't born here. 
Do you yeah. speak Chinese? I speak Cantonese um, enough to get by. Uh -huh. So I, I could speak to the people here, and when I'm in Hong Kong, I could get by, but I don't know Mandarin, so if I'm in Beijing, I'm, I'm stuck. Uh, this Chinatown is one of the oldest. Older than, than the, the New York one? Yes, older than the New York one. Yeah, because uh, San Francisco is kind of in, is in front of China. Yeah, it's the closest. Ah. So this is their first stop. Mm -hmm. And do you feel more uh, Chinese or American? Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I feel more American. Um, you know, I grew up here. Um, like my, I'm not too familiar with my Chinese culture, but I'm, I'm trying to learn. Um, but pretty much all my friends are the same. We all grew up here, so we're more American than Chinese. So here you go, tea tasting. Tea tasting, Would you oh. like to have a try? Of course. I love it. I'll get this food for go first. They start a hangover tea first. Oh, hangover tea. And I'll show you how That's the best way, you know? Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Congestion. It's a mint with red tea. Apple ginseng for focus and concentration. Mm. So this one is focus and concentration. Uh, did you have something for losing hair? Mm -hmm. No, no, let's ask him. If he has something for hangover, he has to have something for, for hair loss. Mm. You put it at the bottom and it just blossoms and it opens up. It's really beautiful. I never saw that. Do your grandmother come to the temple? She comes, but a lot of times when she explains certain things to me, I don't understand it very well. Jade Emperor. Yeah. Okay. Where are you from? Uh, France. Oh. Do you know France? Uh, no. Uh, you have time tomorrow? I have two nights. Oh, because we have a big uh, ceremony. Ceremony uh, on to, uh, tomorrow. Or maybe you can you can say Chinese day. You can, you can say Chinese uh, Valentine's Day. And do you know uh, the signification of all this paper? Every form, family, they put their name. You see, mm -hmm. there's uh, the red paper. And every the white card, that means every land has different name. For fortune, uh, some for the baby, some for good health, some for business. So maybe uh, I have to put one, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you marry? Yes. Oh, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't and, give up. And already a baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Otherwise, I have a girlfriend. Uh, yes, no, I have to right. find a girlfriend. Huh? <laughs> Easy to find a girlfriend. <laughs> okay, so, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you. Thank you very good much. Luck. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good luck. Everybody, good luck. It's been a month since I left Le Havre. I've covered close to 18,000 kilometers. I'm beginning to feel quite at home in my role of gentleman voyager. Leaving San Francisco behind in the fading sunlight, the Queen Elizabeth heads out to sea once more to carry me off to other lands, other peoples, other voyages. There's so much more still to discover. The voyage has just begun.